The Pac-12 football landscape could be changing with the new rule with regards to the championship game. How much could it change? We'll discuss with Carter Baines of BeaverBlitz.com. Let's go. You are Locked On Pac-12, your daily podcast on the Pac-12 Conference. It's the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Locked on Pac-12. I'm your host, Spencer McLaughlin, D1 play-by-play broadcaster. Thanks for making this your first listen or your first view if you're watching on YouTube every day, part of the Locked on Podcast Network. It's your number one source to stay up to date with the Conference of Champions, which is why you should like and subscribe wherever you're listening to or watching this show. I am joined once again today by Carter Baines, senior editor and writer over at beaverblitz.com. And it felt more than appropriate to have him back on after all that wonderful talk we did last week about the North Division and the South Division and how the competitive landscape will shape out. And then the Pac-12 came out with a rule and said, oh, yeah, these don't matter anymore. So, Carter, <laughs> welcome back to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. I mean, we're, we're basically just going to go ahead and backtrack everything we said, right? <laughs> yeah, just to forget that it happened, delete it from your podcast feed, click on next video on YouTube, all that sort of stuff. So the Pac-12 rule change, for those of you who don't know, is that starting this year, not next year, like some conferences, saw the Mountain West, I think, is going to start this in 2023. But This is starting to become the trend in college football. I'm a fan of it personally. What they're saying is they're basically negating the importance of divisions. I imagine one day they'll be gone altogether. They stay for now for scheduling purposes, but it's no longer going to be the Pac-12 North and South champions automatically meeting in the championship game at Allegiant Stadium in Las Vegas. It will now be the teams with the highest conference winning percentage. So, Carter, just right off the top, when you read that rule and realized it would be in place for this year, what were your biggest takeaways? Well, the main one was, wow, that came out of nowhere. Um, You know, I there had been no rumors about it, Um, you know, know, no rumblings on the on the national scene about this even being a thing. Um, But the big thing is, you know, this is not just a Pac-12 situation where, you know, conferences can choose how they select their champion the ncaa itself came out with a rule change saying hey like you have full autonomy of over how you want to pick a a conference champion and what i had heard um i i can't remember where i saw this but it it was from some reputable source that george klyovkov pac-12 commissioner obviously um kind of spearheaded the campaign to get that rule changed he did um so yeah so the pac-12 well, it's not the only conference that's going to take advantage of this. It's the one that kind of led the way and and really wanted to see this happen, um, which I take as a sign of Klyovkov saying, "Hey, like this is a chance for us to um, to to do something that's going to benefit us, and I'm going to you know take initiative and go to the higher ups at the NCAA and and try to make it happen." Um, which is, you know, obviously something you like to see from a Pac-12 commissioner after what we became used to for about, what, 10 to 15 years. Too long. Yeah, too too long we became accustomed to to the conference not being relevant or not being taken seriously or laughed at, yada, yada, yada. And I, I think that this was a really good move and kind of the first big one that he has seen or, or undertaken as the commissioner. You know, the, the decision to move the game to Las Vegas was – probably the last good decision that Larry Scott made. It didn't take place until Klyovkov took over, but that was something that was uh, made under uh, Larry Scott's leadership previously. But I, I was really pleased, and I, I ran in the same spot probably that, that you did, that Larry, or that uh, Klyovkov was the guy who you know brought this to the NCAA and said, hey, th- this should be a rule change. And, and this was also voted on because it had to pass. You know, the It was a regulation that the NCAA – had to take away and they were convinced that yeah this should probably go away and then each conference is allowed to vote on so they could have decided to keep the division format and say it's a north winner and a south winner but it was unanimous from what i read uh from from the athletic directors and the coaches in the conference it it seemed like this was a move that i i think makes a lot of sense and, and, and i'm glad to see that everybody else feels that way too 
Yeah, no, I, I saw the same thing that uh, there was unanimous support from within the conference. And then obviously you're seeing other conferences follow suit uh, in the immediate aftermath. So obviously it's, you know, it's a very popular decision across the country. Um, and I, I think it does give a lot of power to the conferences, which is something I, I think you're probably going to see a lot more of over the next few years is the the future of the NCAA as we know it, you know, kind of, I, I don't know if, if, if crumbles is the right word, but, you know, every, every sign points to the NCAA losing a lot more power over the next few years. And I think this is one of those dominoes to fall where you're going to see the conferences kind of start to dictate things at their level rather than, um, you know, reverting to a, an NCAA regulation guideline rule, you name it. How do you think within the, the context of the Pac-12 conference, obviously it's Pac-12 podcast here, how do you think it affects the competitive landscape? Do you see it as, you know, particularly ground shifting or do you think it's more just a rule change that, that needed to take place? Well, obviously it's going to, it's going to change some things because, what was it? Five of the last what twelve conference championship games would have had five of the different... five of the eleven. Five yeah. of the eleven would have had a different matchup. Okay, so they yeah, I mean that's almost half of the games would have had a different matchup uh, had this rule been in place since day one of the of this conference going with a divisional format and um, you know having twelve teams. The fact that you know we we have a number like that suggests okay well this is going to bring tangible change we're going to see this come into play probably in year one if not year two um of of this rule being in place so as far as competitive balance or you know any advantages go my my prediction here is that it's going to favor divisions rather than teams i, I think Going into a year like 2022, we look at the at the two divisions and say, all right, the South is substantially better than the North, right? Yeah. I, I, I think you're going to see teams that normally would have gotten bounced from contention because they have better teams ahead, the, ahead of them in their own division. Um, you know, obviously they're going to be able to to make a name for themselves and, and, and get into this this championship game without having to... Uh, give way to somebody who's ahead of them in their own division standing. So I think immediately, obviously with the division still being in place this year, the South has a big advantage because a, a team like USC doesn't have to beat out UCLA and Utah and Oregon to win the conference championship. It just has to be, I guess, one or two of them. It, it, does that make sense? Yeah, no, no, I I, I completely agree with you there. there. There's one criticism I've noticed kind of floating around that I want to ask you about. But first, I want to remind you, our partners at Bet Online continue to be the number one source for all your betting needs and sports info. You can find all the latest odds, news, and sports developments, including this year's basketball playoffs, Major League Baseball scores, fights, and even next season's NFL futures. Go Mariners, by the way. Painfully, it's a little, it's it's, it's tough times out there for for the M's. But Bet Online is your continued source for all your sports wagering information, from live betting to playoffs, esports, and more. Head to the website today, or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in action. Bet Online, where the game starts. So one kind of counterpoint to this that I, I I've seen, just kind of not in a significant way, but. There's clearly a, a few people out there who hold this opinion, so I think it's valid to to address it when when talking about this rule change. And I'm a fan of it, and you're a fan of it as well. The other side of it is you could lessen the impact of certain division games, right? So Utah USC might not carry quite as much weight if you know that's the only loss that that one of them ends up having. They meet in the championship game anyway. What, what would you say to to that side of the coin? I mean, I think it's fair, but that's why you're going to see divisions fall apart anyways. Uh, there's no way that beyond next year, uh, the Pac-12 is still going to have a north-south format. I, I just don't see that. I, I mean, the only reason it makes sense is to limit travel, you know, when when traveling, when uh, when schedule considerations are taken into account. Other than that, there really is no reason to have divisions anymore. Um, so I'm, I'm curious to see if if George Klyovkov has a plan to keep those in place and, and how he might do that. Um, but no, I, I don't think you're going to see divisions past this year or, or maybe the next. And so then, you know, at that point, 
um, th that concern about certain divisional games having less meaning and, and less value is kind of thrown out the window because you don't have divisions in the first place. Um, and, you know, when, when you're going off of win percentage, every game is important. Yeah, I, I just think it's a more logical way to do it because even if, you know, on an individual level, say, you know, Utah UCLA or Utah USC or USC UCLA is not as impactful as it might have been under the divisions format, you're going to get a better championship game because we, we've seen that, we, you know, we were talking earlier, five of the 11 Pac-12 championship games would have been different. And several of them would have been much more intriguing matchups. You could have had an Apple Cup rematch that year. The Cougars won, I believe it was 10 games. They were 10 and one, got up, I think, to number six nationally with, with Mike Leach. And then they lost to the Huskies, who he just couldn't quite get through. And then Dickert was able to the, this past season, finally. But you could have had a rematch between number 11, Washington, number 13, Washington State. You could have had a couple more Oregon Stanford games when it was, you know, those two teams at the top of the conference you could uh, Colorado would have made uh, another appearance I, I just think that when you look at you know uh, take 2011 for instance the the first Pac-12 championship game which was played at Autzen Stadium you had Oregon against a six and six UCLA team uh, like USC was on uh, probation right they were sanctioned because of the NCAA investigation and all and all that sort of stuff but you ended up with a six and six UCLA team it's like the two best teams of the conference without USC being eligible were clearly Oregon and Stanford. And so what, the next thing I want to ask you, Parker, or Parker, Carter, sorry, um, we, we met a few weeks ago. Give me, cut me a little bit of slack. Not a lot, just, just, just a touch. But the other thing is, I think you have the potential to have a bigger Pac-12 championship game when it comes to the matchup, right? Where, that's going to generate more interest. I mean, who was watching Oregon? you know, beat UCLA 49-31 at, at, at Autzen Stadium, nonetheless, right? Who wants to see a matchup where you're like, oh, it should be this team, right? I feel like that diminishes the, the value of the game. It diminishes what it could bring to the table from a national viewership perspective. Do you think that it'll help to, to raise the conference's profile in that sense where you're always putting your two best teams on the field to showcase this is what our conference is about and this is what championship football looks like? Yeah, absolutely. To your point about 2011, I mean, the only thing that game had going for it in terms of like, you know, fan excitement was the fact that it was the first time the Pac-12 had done it. That was yep. it. There were no outside impl implications. Um, whereas, you know, now un under this new format, you're talking about two potentially 10, 11 win teams going at it um, with with no chance of you know some team who got hot in Pac-12 play and and sneaking their way, way in, um, you know having a chance to take down one of your your college football playoff contenders, uh, in in under this format, you're going to have your two best options out there. And I think in a time where the college fo college football world revolves around those final four teams, that college football playoff, there is no more important time to ensure that. In the final week of the season, before bowl, before bowl season, before the postseason, that you have your conference has its two best teams on display, on a national stage, fighting for another win that is going to one boost their resume and two add another win to their total. Um, I, you know, there's there's a reason people tune into the SEC championship because it's always a semifinal game for the college football playoff. Pretty much. Pac-12 championship game hasn't been that really. There have been times where, you know, you've seen teams need to win it to get into the Pac to the college football playoff, but it's never been a true quarterfinal game for the national championship. Whereas I, I think under this format, it has the potential to be that, especially if the conference as a whole can, um, you know, elevate itself. And, you know, you see a, a USC Oregon or a USC Utah game, um, feature two like top eight teams. Um, I, I think that's where this format really shines. Yeah, and it's worth noting as well that it's not that it would have changed the the teams that match up there every season, right? When Oregon and Utah met, it would have been Oregon and Utah both times. You would have had a, you know the, the same matchups with a, a Stanford team. Uh, I, I forgot that in I think it was 2013, 2012, Arizona State was, was in the Pac-12 championship game and, and they came out of the South. You know, I, I think that getting rid of, of the divisions, as you said, is inevitable. 
I, I just don't know why why you would keep them. We'll, we'll talk about scheduling here in a moment. But talking about you know a, a de facto almost quarterfinal game when you're talking about the SEC championship, right? I think that this allows for that potential. But the the other side is that the Pac-12 has to now elevate itself at, as a conference to be able to put teams in that position. And you had that a little bit in 2019. If Utah beats Oregon, they're probably into the college football playoff at 12 and one. You're adding another top win to your resume. And that, and that's why it's good for the conference writ large, because what you're looking at now is teams have the ability to always add another quality win to, to their resume. And there's no chance at all, really, unless the conference gets wildly down. But even in the years where it's been down, uh, during the last several, I would argue, the next best team is still going to boost the resume of whoever wins the conference championship, right? It is Utah beat Oregon again. And I think the rematches are a, a really fun concept as well that, that we'll continue to see. But Utah beat Oregon again. If they hadn't started so slow, they would have been a college football playoff contender, and that win would have bolstered them there. And so rather than hoping that it ends up working out that way, you ensure that you're going to get the best matchup possible and you can you can put the best teams on the field. So I, I definitely like that. But for the conference to get to that sort of level where it, it has the sort of implications where you're thinking, okay, if this team wins, could they sneak their way into the college football playoff? You're obviously going to jump to USC with Lincoln Riley. Oregon and Utah have been right there. Oregon, one of the two Pac-12 teams to get into the playoff. What else do you think the conference needs to do on, on an individual team level? Which, which programs need to be able to elevate so that the the conference championship profile on a national scale continues to, to rise? Well, I, I turn to Washington first and foremost. I mean, that's a team that's been to the college football playoff, so they have the track record there. Um, it's just a matter of getting back to that level. Um, I, I think that's a program that obviously has the tradition. It has the support from its fan base and from its university. And it hopes now that it has a head coach that can get it back to national relevance. Um, the fact that the Huskies have already done it, I, I think, makes them a prime candidate to you know, bounce back and, and maybe be one of the teams that, that benefits from this format. Because you, know, you could see a Washington-Oregon uh, Pac-12 championship now, whereas you wouldn't see it before if, if the South, you know, as it be now, um, has, has a down year. So Washington's a, a team that I look to there. Obviously, USC getting back with, with Lincoln Riley. I, I think everyone in this conference hopes that USC can, you know, can be one of those perennial college football playoff contenders. Um, Utah has been so close. Um, it's just a matter of, like you said, can they put it together for a full 12 game season? Um, those are those are the three outside of Oregon, who's obviously there every year. Um, that I would look to as being candidates, but I don't know, maybe you see a UCLA or a um, heck, even like a, a Washington state, you know, a, a teams that have been on the precipice of, of making that next, that leap into the, the top tier of the PAC 12. Maybe you see one of them break through over the next couple of years and, you know, having this new format, maybe, maybe it makes it easier for them to get into a PAC 12 championship game one year. And maybe that's all the, you know, maybe that's the break they need. Yeah, Washington State was, was really close one year. I think UCLA is a program that maybe has the potential to to get close, right? I, I, not that they could, you know, get there easily, but you could start to have conversations from time to time about, okay, is, is that team going to be able to get there? Are they going to be able to get over the hump? I think you're 100% right on, on Washington that that's where you have to jump to because as a program, they've been there before. And I think they, if they can get the recruiting back, to you know kind of where it was in in that in that chris peterson era with uh, with the teams that went to the, the college football playoff and were competing for them then i think they they can be close let's wrap up today talking about scheduling because that's the only reason that you know it, it's a formality basically that divisions are hanging around for a little bit longer so when you talk about scheduling the way it's worked in, in the pac-12 is you have you know nine conference games and there's two teams that that you miss for usually a, a year or two, right? And it kind of rotates around, but you always play everybody in your division. So uh, broadly speaking, Carter, where do you see schedule going? scheduling going now that, that the division's component is removed? 
I, I think if the pack if if the Pac twelve takes scheduling, you know, if if they approach it with the hey, we want to position our best teams um, to be in the best position possible come November, early December. Um, which George Klyovkov has said, you know, the main goal here is getting a team to the college football playoff. All of our decisions are going to be made with that in mind. Um, I, I think you're going to see some of the top teams, like I, I think they're going to get some really easy conference schedules. I, I think you'll see a USC, you know, year in and year out playing the Bay Area schools if, if they're down, you know, in, ensuring that that their South Division, their former South Division um, matchups against Colorado and and you know a, a recently lowly Arizona team are still intact. Um, I, I think on a year to year basis, the conference is probably going to look at, hey, you know, we expect this team to be really good. Let's match them up against some teams that we expect to be not so good. That's not going to help strength of schedule necessarily, but I mean, their conference games, like the committee, is going to look at a conference record and say, okay, that's still a good body of work for the most part. Um, I don't think that's going to hold you back. But the one thing that has held the Pac-12 back is conference teams beating up on each other. So yep. if you can limit that to an extent, you know, if, if you can limit that as much as possible, I, I think that's something that you have to do. And so I, I would expect, given Klyovkov's track record of making every decision um, with, you know, sending a college football playoff team to wherever the, the you know, that, that final four is being played, um, I would expect him to to take advantage of of that scheduling flexibility like that. Yeah, I still want to see you know some big time regular season matchups mm -hmm. preserved, right? I I wouldn't want him to like. I understand if they if they come in with that approach, but I'm someone who loves the college football regular season, and, and it's not always just about the college football playoff. And so I think one way that you have to raise the conference's profile is you have to have those big-time matchups during the regular season as well. You need to have... I mean, game day had a Pac-12 team, what, once a season? Ago? It was uh, Oregon, UCLA. I don't even remember. if Were they in Utah? I don't think they were. Uh, I, no, I don't think so. They, they were at UCLA for that Oregon game. Um, Washington State recently within the last three years. But other than that, no. I, yeah, I it, it, you just haven't had those sort of big time high profile games. And everybody, you know, starts their Saturdays in the fall by waking up and watching game day. I know I have ever since I was six years old. That's how I start every Saturday. I wake up, watch game day. And you're not going to get as much coverage as a conference if you don't have those sorts of big time regular season matchups. So what, what are the, you know, aside from the traditional rivalries, you know, Oregon, Oregon State, not going anywhere. Stanford, Cal, it's not going anywhere. The Apple Cup, it's not going anywhere. Arizona State, ASU, all, all of those, right, Utah, Colorado, they're going to play every year. But what non-traditional rivalries do you want to see preserve or teams that are playing basically every year on, on a conference-wide level? It's interesting because I think in some of the other large conferences, Big Ten, um, SEC, like the divisional structure there has really limited their ability to, to go cross division. Um, and so they do generally have one or two protective right, protected rivalries that you see every year. Um, you know, I can't think any off, off the top of my head, but I, I know that they exist, but in the PAC 12, like if, if I think about teams in the North and, and, you know, versus teams in the South, all of those rivalries that we think of in this conference happen within those divisions. I, I can't think of one off the top of my head that stands out where it's like, hmm, yeah, this North team and the South team always go at it and their fan bases don't really like each other. Um, I, I think in the last couple of years, you've seen a little bit of that with Oregon and Utah. Um, so that's that's something that I would like to see year after year. And, and to your point, you're putting two of the best teams in the conference uh, head to head. That's a game that, you know, could be featured on game day. That's a game that's going to get picked up by ABC. Um, it's going to get a primetime slot, which to your point, again, you need that to raise your conference profile. Um, but I can't, to be honest with you, I can't think off the top of my head of, of one cross division matchup that, uh, that stands out as something that we need to preserve. I, I will say the California schools, you know, having four of them and two of them in, in each division. Now I'd like to see some more you know, I'd like to see some some matchups between uh, between those schools protected because you know I, I think there's something to be said for the NorCal SoCal thing. 
Um, you know, a, a lot of the players on those teams take a lot of pride in being from LA versus San Francisco or, you know, a, I don't know, Orange County versus Berkeley. Um, it, it would be fun to see those teams go at it. Yeah. I wonder if any, you know, avid rivalries will, will start to form because teams are going to play each other more often. I think if you're looking at it from a conference wide perspective, I think you have to have Oregon, Utah, and USC, at least in the immediate future. I feel like they have to play each other every year because you're talking about how can you get a game that's, you know, in prime time, maybe going to be in contention or even get college game day to, to get there. Oregon, Utah, USC are the three biggest brands in the Pac-12 right now. And I, I'm actually with you that I don't think there's a huge, you know, cru- maybe Washington State, Arizona develops because Jaden Delora went down there, right? Like maybe something like that you know, starts to starts to bloom as as this format goes on or whenever the divisions officially go away. But I just feel like with, with those with those three teams that are clearly your biggest brands, the college football playoff contenders right now, I mean, USC hasn't even proven they can be that, but their brand power alone, just being the USC Trojans and the fact that their uniforms haven't changed in like 25 years is enough for people to know who they are, recognize them, and, and also want to see them as well so that's what stands out to me not two teams but three i feel like you 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 have to try and create the best matchups right and if you're going to do that i feel like you have to have the oregon usc utah trio i just i think if you play them every year for the next five years i feel like that creates a lot of big games okay so so you'll go contrary to to what i was saying about maximizing wins for for certain teams yeah i I mean no i mean but both are important because obviously if you if you schedule usc versus um i don't know cal every year year after year to to bolster the trojans win total that's a game that nobody's tuning into and and nobody on the east coast cares about it but if you ensure that usc is going to play washington oregon utah um stanford a couple years ago you know, year after year, people are going to pay attention to that, and it's going to it's going to bolster the profile of the conference. Um, I, I'm just curious to see where the line is drawn between conferences' best interest on a week to week basis and conferences' best interest in getting a team to the college football playoff. Yeah, you, you it's it's a good point, and I I am looking at a little bit more through the regular season lens of mm-hmm. you have to have those those sorts of big games. You can't just have it be you know, dependent on, on the postseason because college football's regular season is, is so critically important. It's such an, an integral part of the sport, whereas, you know, basketball and baseball, they're so long. It's just kind of, you know, something that that you do and you have fun rivalries every now and then and such. But in football, it's all about that that one day and that one game. And, and I feel like in the short term, while USC, I don't think is ready to make the college football playoff yet, but certainly can be in in the next year or two with Lincoln Riley and the way they're utilizing the transfer portal. I think in the next year or two, I'd argue it's more beneficial to think about the the short term conference profile raising matchups that take place in the regular season because USC is not going to be ready to get there. And the other thing is getting a team back to the college football playoff is great, but ultimately the goal right is for someone in the conference to win a national championship. And I don't think you can do that unless you're actually battle tested. You've gone through the ringer and you've you know had to beat good teams over and over again. Whereas if you're just playing you know the easiest schedule possible in the Pac-12, I think that's a level of competition that's not going to put you at a level where you can compete with the Alabamas and Georgias of the world. And by the way, you're talking about protected rivalries in the SEC. I think Alabama and Georgia have one because they're not they're not in the same division. They play every year, and that's the sort of game that I'm talking about. Like those big matchups in the SEC, like Florida LSU is huge. Alabama Georgia is huge, and, and those are just regular season games. And I want to see the Pac-12 have as many of those as they can. Yeah, no, I, I'm fully on board with that. I mean, I, I think there's something to be said for the the week to week excitement, make, making sure that you have one or two big games in your conference uh, on a given week. It's you know, it's just the like I said, the, a fine line between you know how do we make sure that our best teams are winning as many games as possible, and how do we make sure that they're beating good teams along the way that you know draw viewers to our conference it's it's a dilemma that uh, that george klyovkov is facing right now but i think um somebody with a media background like he has I, I think he might go he he might lean in your favor and and go with a 
hey, let's let's get eyeballs on these teams first and, the, and then let the wins take care of themselves. Yeah, and at some point, the programs have to, you know, do some of the heavy lifting here. I mean, right. he, yeah. he can set it up the best way possible as a commissioner, but the teams also have to be well run. They have to win games and, you know, they have to be able to, to recruit as well. All stuff we continue to cover here on the show. Carter Baines, senior editor and writer at beaverblitz.com. Appreciate the insight as always, not just about the bees covering uh, everything here in the Pac-12. Thanks for having me. Oh, yeah. Any time, my man. I appreciate all of you listening. I will see you next time and have a wonderful rest of your day.